Welcome to In The Room, where we explore the elusive world of casting for film, TV, and commercials. Join us as we interview directors, writers, producers, and actors, taking a deep dive into their experiences with casting and how the ultimate decisions are made in bringing a story to the screen. Get an inside look at casting and find out what really goes on in the room. Welcome. I'm Heather Kafka, and I'm an actor. I'm John Williams. I'm a casting director. And today we are with the amazing multi-hyphenate Frank Mosley. Um, Frank Mosley is an actor and filmmaker from Texas living in Los Angeles. He is a fellow of the 2015 Berlin L Talents, 2017 NYFF Artist Academy, and 2016 Workshop for Auteurs, led by Kiristami. And you know what? <clears throat> Honestly. <laughs> There's just like already you're like stop it. It's stop just it. it's ridiculous. When we it's, have to start speaking French or something like that, it like, gets it gets tricky. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's just there's words on here like you know kinescope and visages yeah. and slam dance. The whole I, I should have given you the whole. There's a glossary. I, I mean, <laughs> RogerEbert.com. I mean, we'll we'll make a downloadable PowerPoint for people available. <laughs> It's it's oh, like no. honestly, I just want to encourage everyone to oh, go man. to frankmosley.com and explore his website because seriously though, and I don't say this about everyone. It's the website's beautiful. The oh, imi thanks. the imagery is gorgeous and there's lots of fun free stuff to explore. You can watch some of the shorts he's acted in, directed, acted and directed at the same time uh for free. Yeah. You can see trailers mm -hmm. to the features he's done, links to all <clears> the articles to the other podcasts. Um, yeah. Frank has literally, uh, since the day that I have met him, never stopped working. He's like the little engine that could. He just, um, it's like, we would all do something. We would do a project and then everybody sort of stops for post-production and, you know, I would wait and do auditions and, we would meet for a beer or whatever, the rest of us, and Frank wouldn't be there because Frank would already have met other people and be on their set doing their thing. And it would all be a bunch of people we either didn't know or some pseudo-famous person that were like, what? But how did Frank get over there with them? How? Because he's a hustler, baby, and he just kept working and hustling all the time, and he never, ever stopped. And I just feel like consistently throughout the last i don't know 20 however many years frank has just constantly either been writing stuff making stuff producing stuff acting in stuff creating 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 he has just always been so furtive with creative energy and that is what i have always associated with about you is just you are so well-rounded in all of your creative efforts and like, just let's start from the beginning of that. Well, first of all, thank you, Heather. It was very, very, very nice of you. I have to look, um, up, I have to look up furtive, but yes. You, really you're, nice. you're fertile. Uh, <laughs> fertile. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm fertile with creativity. That, if that comes out in any way, I'm glad. You Honestly, I, uh, I, I fester. I fester. Is that I what it have, is? Yeah, if I don't have a lot going on, I just feel... And sometimes I think it's a it's a double edged sword, right? Because it's good to be busy, but on the other hand, I've learned over all those years, like you said, it's like you can sometimes too too much. You can yeah. push yourself too much, and then it's not good for anybody. It's not good for the people you're collaborating with because you can't give it your all, and right. you should because that's part of the deal when you sign on to it. Especially if it's somebody who's like, oh, I wrote this part for you. It feels more personal and like, well, I really don't want to fuck it up now because yeah. I have to be on my A game. I have to be present every chance I get, you know. But I will say but, mostly overall in that journey, whenever I've encountered you, you've been so positive about it. I feel like with me, a lot of times I've been real angsty about it. You know, like, <laughs> I, well, gotta, I, can, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. I appreciate and you've you always... saying that too, but I have my days of, you know, everybody has their days sure. right, of, of angst and uh doubt and paranoia and fear and all those things come just bubbling up to the surface um so it happens but i try to keep 
as optimistic an outlook as I can, but you know, trying to be realist at the same well, so time. Where do with you that. think it's a weird balancing act of like, you know, you got to look at it in a real way, sure. but still keep that dream funneling your energy. But doing a deep dive in your in your world, it seems like the ideas keep coming though. Like it seems like you do you, you need that quiet time for those to give birth, right? But it seems like it seems like a very consistent, like she said, that the, that the unique, interesting perspective that you bring seems to be uh, endless. Well, I, I appreciate that because it certainly doesn't feel always endless. And I feel very slow to birth anything that comes from me. Like as a writer, director, I feel like my films come out every two or three years, usually a short. Haven't done features in a long time. Um, the last two shorts I made were written by somebody else. So that was a different experience of kind of directing somebody else's material. In a weird way, it was kind of a break from having to worry about the story because I was able to come in as a director and make decisions way more quickly because I wasn't being so precious because it wasn't my script. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, I'm interpreting this script from somebody else. I go, okay. And immediately I'm like, camera goes here, camera goes here, the edit point is here. And immediately it all becomes very technical, very easy. Um, That's but interesting. I miss writing because I've been slow to write. I'm a very slow writer, unlike my wife, who like she's a prolific writer every day, disciplined so many hours a day. It's really inspiring. You know? I feel like we've heard actor directors say that before. Like Macon said that that like it's a it's a kind of break for him to go from acting to direct to directing something that's not his or was it mm. i can't remember who it was that was like it feels like better sometimes to direct something that's not his and you it's find that the ideas come easier mm -hmm. to you as a director the 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 sort of like perspective just because you don't have to come up with the creative side as far as the yeah. actual moment it's just your opinion totally. yeah yeah, for, for me, it's like, I love, I mean, I love to direct, I love to write, I love to act, but I, they don't all necessarily have to be at the same time. In fact, I, I have so much admiration for people like, like Jim Cummings or like certain people who are always acting and directing at the same time, ba but that's Bateman's not for been, me. Bateman's been doing it well lately too, like Jason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But for me, it's just, I have a, an aversion to that. It's just a taste thing where like, I'd rather cast a friend in that role and uh just focus on the camera just you mm -hmm. know i can just wear whatever i want i don't have to jump back and forth it's like just focus on the frame mm -hmm. i feel like you know. directing always wins in that relationship like it's always like you're here and it's like then you're like yes. okay no yeah i'll be there in a second and you try to jump in and you just kind of half-heartedly give it your your go you know absolutely yeah and no, and i'm not saying that this happens all the time obviously because there are some great performances from for sure of certain films but but I've noticed, at least from certain, some buddies and friends of buddies over the years, I've seen stuff where I'm like, I feel like the performance suffered just, like maybe it was just a little. I think it has to, tell. to they, had, they struggle a little more turning it on when they jump to the other side. I mean, my brain can only fit you know? three or four things in it at one time. So yeah, for sure. Like I think it has <laughs> yeah. to, you know? Yeah. Okay, well, so what I'm interested to pick your brain about before we go too deep into that direction is like where, <clears throat> so... When you think about that, what was the seed that originally grew? What do you think it was if like you wanted to make a movie or you felt a performance energy? Like when you were a little kid, where did Frank Mosley first start having the desire for a cinematic eye or a performance or a storytelling, a writing? What did it first look like? It's all my dad. Yeah? It's all my dad. Yeah. So when I was four years old, my mom was out of town. My dad had a Sony Hi8 Handycam on loan from his brother-in-law, and he was bored. Oh. And he was like, let's make a movie. I'm four years old, so he goes, let's make The Wizard of Oz. And <gasps> so we basically reconstruct The Wizard of Oz, and I play all the parts except for the witch's guard who he plays in a cameo he's like he turns the camera around he's like you killed her the witch is dead and then like he flips it back but uh he was an actor director it, he was yeah yeah exactly <laughs> even then my dad was and my that was the thing my dad is the is the reason i got into all this because when he made that movie with me he played it back for me as soon as we shot it and i was in awe because like wait a minute my little brain was working overtime because i said we just shot this you bottled it in this little device, and now you're letting me see what we just did, just like the movies we watch at home. 
So all of a sudden I was like, oh, we can do this. This is within reach. This is not something that's this far-fetched dream or idea as a little boy. So by first grade, I was, you know, directing movies with that same camera now using my buddies. And that just continued all through middle school into high school. When I joined theater in high school, I just would use all the theater kids as my cast members. Like, oh, I need to cast this role. I'll call so and so from class, and they'll come in and do it. Um, so, it really, is my is my dad and and my mom. So they're both so um, they've to to this day to now like they're so supportive with what I do, and they're so arts focused, and they've always nurtured me in the arts. They've always said, try it, see if you like it. But my dad in particular, he was always a movie aficionado, you know, movie nut on his own time before I came into the picture. So he would, he would be the one guy of his friends who would drive out to the Inwood theater in Dallas to see art house movies, you know, when nobody else was going out there to see it. So by the time I was middle school, he would take me out there and he introduced me to the Coen brother movies and all these films that became staples of of my youth. Um, and you know, and he, I grew up on Chaplin films. He showed me Chaplin. He showed me, uh, foreign films. I, you know, reading subtitles when I was young and it's all him. That's all my dad. What did so he, I have, what did I have he, them to he thank do for work? For What'd you say? What did he do for work? He, he is and was, uh, he's a landlord. Uh, he owns several homes in DFW. And so he has the flexibility. Yeah. He would, you know, first he was flipping houses and then he just started renting them out. And it gave him flexibility to be there around with me as I was growing up so that he was present for so many of those formative experiences. Um, he so also, great. and this is kind of a side note, but he, uh, he also deals in antique games, like old, like fortune tellers and like wrote a, like a cowboy, mechanical arm cowboy you know, quick draws and uh, mutoscopes and all these things. So growing up, all these machines and gadgets and toys were in my I mean, world. He kind of living, wax yeah, an artist lifestyle, kind of. Totally. Yeah. I mean, so and it, he worked at a wax museum in the '80s in Grand Prairie, and so that wax museum was like a second home. I was like, I get to shoot movies there on their sets after hours. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, he's I. So my production value was through the roof. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> these giant sets and lighting and all this, you know. And oh, it, that's so it's all cool. it's all my parents really well i don't even know where to go with the next question because so, so, that one yeah, tore me in half i'm that, over that, here crying for those of you on youtube who can see that so you're in the dallas scene and it seems like the other side of paradise is kind of when your first sort of like pop happened right uh shout out to, to to ariana martin as well i know her. yeah, yeah. Ari oh she's yeah she's, she's great so i went to college with justin hilliard uh, film school UTA <clears throat> under Bart Weiss. And I was there with Justin Hillier and all these other people. And Ariane was auditioning for our films. So we all became a little group. But that movie was a that movie was a turning point because it was only the second feature I'd ever acted in. But it was also a lead and it was a chance to transform. And it was something that as a you know burgeoning actor from you know high school theater and all these things the juicy kind of part you were wanting when they were like, okay, you're going to play an ex-con. You shave your head. We're giving you fake tattoos. Oh, yeah. You're just this like coiled hard ass who says very little. And yet somehow you got to still be funny, but still be kind of scary in moments. And I was like, just give it to me. Like I'm ready to go. I was so excited. <laughs> and uh, it was the first, I, I'm so grateful to Justin and Ariane for giving, writing me that because they wanted to give me something new to do. They knew that I had the hunger for that and they believed in me. And that role really was the one that I think on a local film scene was the one where people went from, oh, Frank just likes to act with friends to, oh, Frank's an actor. Like he wants to, he's willing to like really work at something or change his look or do these things. And it was like the most removed for me in a way. And so uh, that was a, a really big turning point. And I, I think, I hopefully, I think it was like, kind of the jump start to just getting more work and offers and auditions and got me an agent. So that was good. Yeah. It, it, it felt like that as far as looking at your stuff. And then it felt like it, at that point where you, you said, okay, I think, did they give you the confidence to be like, okay, I think I can get outside of Dallas or I'm going to, cause, cause I know, I know just from, you know, working in Dallas and casting in Dallas, 
it's limited, right? And so you, there's that yeah. le- there's that leap that has to happen. Yeah, even in Austin too, it's like you have to. Well, back then you would have to wait until whatever mm-hmm. comes to town, right? Yeah. It's mm-hmm. like you got to hope for the mini series that comes to town or the TV show that comes to town. You can only get so far. You can only. And I will get- say. Yes, Heather. And but but I will say though, just to clarify, it's like I didn't it's not like I started getting even opportunities for shows even then in 09. Yeah. It was all indie indie worlds, like right. my bread and butter. And it still is. I mean, I, maybe this is a part of the conversation for later, but I can count on one hand the amount of times I auditioned for something and got a role. Everything has just been No, through that's what's so great about people like yeah, you're, people you. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. You especially, I feel like, have such a strong um, like network of people that you've been just able to like work on their films and shows and things like that consistently that you seem like one of my friends. I have a handful of them who I can't really think is even in the audition world of having to like go audition for stuff um but works all the time yeah but it's it's a weird feeling though right heather because it's like on one hand i'm grateful for the work and indie films i like that world i like the way films are made in that world and sometimes you get a chance to have bigger roles more consistently but the flip side is that i've never done any professional tv right i've auditioned my ass off for 20 years and it's always like between you and the other guy or it's you know it's close or whatever the thing is and i i get that but it's uh it's one of those things right i keep trying because it would be so nice grass is always greener right but it it would be so nice to have to work in that sphere because i'm so used to the indie world that right. will never leave i'll always have that you know but it really would be nice to to try a different world for a change sure you know? yeah it's almost like its you own know. shadow industry i mean what we find here also is that the grass is always greener and it's like you want to do this other this bigger stuff and then once you get to the bigger world you're like I'm it's gonna- crap over <laughs> it's here crap. Yeah. It's like right right selling right. selling tide pods and shit you know and you get to yeah. like shave your head and get fake tattoos and be scary yeah <laughs> you know? like- yeah i mean it's true and again i'm so grateful because and you know this goes back to your question in a way about like how it started but like in that time like oh nine basically from like oh i'd say oh seven oh six through Oh nine, and then maybe into 11, 10 or eleven. It was like that time in Dallas where it's like Yin Tan was there, Clay Lyford was there, David Lowry was there, James Johnson was there. Everybody was just hanging out, and then some of them moved to Austin, which was cool because I eventually moved to Austin. But then a lot of them moved, you know, outside Texas entirely. But yeah. those those roots that were planted were so strong, and by working with those guys at that time. It led to, as Heather was saying, you know, you're working on a film by James Johnson and the gaffer is like, hey, I'm doing a short next week. Do you want to be a part of it? And it just was easy to leapfrog your way and to keep working. And it's, but it's really because of that group of people. I think if we didn't have such a strong sense of community at that time, you know, right on that edge of mumblecore and all that happening, it's like, I don't think maybe I would have had that extra fire to to keep pushing um, into a bigger plane that I did. You know, because yeah. I had enough friends saying, hey, there's an opportunities here, Frank. Don't miss out, you know. Yeah, yeah. So then at that point, you have an agent in Dallas, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. Linda McAllister. And yeah. you're auditioning. And mm-hmm. what is that like? Some of these first audition experiences. Did did you, had you taken classes? Did anyone teach you how to audition? Does no. anyone ever learn how to audition? No. Yeah, this, like, is, this, no, is my, a good question. this is my next no. favorite question to ask people. <laughs> no, did anyone I, I ever re- teach us how to do that? No, I never did. I never did acting classes or any of that. It was always just I, I would watch a lot of things online, like you know, workshops online. I would read a lot of books, um, and I would just try just the repetition of doing it. I would just try to grow. And I know for a fact, you know, you just you hopefully get better as as you age. So I'm sure my auditions weren't great starting, starting off. Um, but it definitely started giving me confidence to act in front of strangers and to be outside of my sphere of people who I felt comfortable with. Um, but it was slow going. I mean, again, that was like, I was just mainly focused like, Oh, every now and then audition for 
what Walker, Texas Ranger or whatever was happening at the time. But then I knew I would still have an indie project to do. Um, so it was pretty much the same thing at that point. Even though I had an agent, I had access to things, but I wasn't necessarily booking. Did you feel like you had an opinion about your auditioning? Like, did it just blend together with your acting and the process? Or did you did you go into it and all of a sudden it felt like a different thing where you were like, shit, I'm not good at this. I need to figure out how to do this. Or Yeah. Did it Absolutely. It did I, it? I've I felt uh, I overthought things. I think at times I would, especially then in my twenties, I would, I would um, really overthink a character, and I would try. My Achilles' heel was that I wanted to try so hard to make it different mm. or interesting that I think sometimes I fucked myself out of possible jobs but instead of just doing the thing that's on the page and sometimes I, I have that issue even now or my wife will be taping me and sometimes she's like you're bringing a really interesting version of the character I and mean, that's actually kind of cool but sometimes she goes you're the banker just be the banker right like, I, I just you're just yeah. you're a teller you say the line don't overthink it you know and it's good advice that i still take even now it's like just say the line i think that's you the know. key to you getting on you know. tv and getting on mainstream is that they don't want they don't want you to be too creative <laughs> yeah and that, that's kind of honestly the uh because so, well i won't i won't even say what show it was or whatever but i remember there was a particular role i went out for and i was so proud of that audition i prepped for like a week i had it down the, the dialogue it was a really intense scene too and i was like this is it like i've got to get if i don't get it at least i've got to come close well i didn't get it of course but i saw the show later and the actor they chose the thing that was disconcerting was we were a similar type physically which I didn't want to see. Yeah. But the performance style was totally different. And even in the way he interpreted the character, I was like, wow. I was like, maybe I should just like say the lines. I know there's that, that whole uh, David Mamet philosophy of his theater acting where his whole idea is just like, just say the words. Like mm -hmm. let, the, let the connotation of the words do the emoting and you can be a blank face. It's like the Kuleshov effect, if you ever heard of that. Mm -hmm. But it's like where... You can look at anything, and depending on how the audience is reacting to it, they will project mm -hmm. yes. what they want I mean, to feel. That De Niro right? talks about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, all these totally. Yeah. And so I love, I love that idea. And so it's like, you know, what can you do to just say the lines and 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 just let the audience, you know, let let the lines <gasps> speak for themselves. There's also this world, there's this world that happens where you come in and you do something that's super interesting. The director loves it, and then you get on set, and they're like. That was great. Well, we loved what you did, but could you just do it with a smile? <laughs> you know, or could you just, <laughs> yeah, could you just, yeah. could you just, yeah. could you just like, you know, smile more, you know, and it's like, it, and it mm -hmm. changes. So a lot of times what gets you on set isn't necessarily what ends up on the screen, you know? That's, that's very, and that's true. And that's actually something I should try experimenting more with. It's just doing less in the uh, audition room and knowing I could bring it if they wanted me to yeah. ramp it up or whatever the case is. I will say I've gotten way better now. Uh, in early 40s now as as being not caring as much yeah. about the other. Whereas yeah. I used you, to care more and now I'm like, you know, I'll put work into it. I yeah. won't yeah. toss it off. Yeah. But it, I'm like, whatever. As soon as I'm done, I just throw it back yeah. in the rearview mirror, you know. I think you say that too. Like so. you you do you turn in things. You're like, I, didn't, I can't believe I got this. Like I didn't even, I wasn't prepared. I didn't yeah. try. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, uh, like a kind of near cousin to that, I was having a conversation with a director a casting director at a party recently and she was telling me something really fascinating I hadn't thought about. We were talking about the self-tape situation and how does she feel about what she's getting? Because I was telling her, I'm feeling kind of guilty at this stage because I feel like you casting directors deserve better from me than what you're getting at this point because I'm frustrated in our relationship now because I feel like it's broken because we never get in the room together anymore. And, you know, I'm not giving you my best because it doesn't feel like we are connecting anymore. It's not two sided. We don't volley back and forth. And 
So now when you ask something of me, I'm just like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, it just feels like I'm just doing a lottery scratch off and it just goes nowhere. So I'm already kind of bitter and pissed off and this is not going to be convenient for me and it's interrupting my time and it usually ends up being for nothing. Here you go, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah. already a little bit like bitter about it. me, And she was telling me, that she's actually finding that she's getting a lot of tapes from people that she's getting excited by because mm. people are sending in stuff where they're kind of like, um, they're almost like new finds, almost where she's like, uh, how did she describe it? Like they, they almost forget that the casting director's watching them. Oh, because they're so yeah. not getting any feedback at all. Like that relationship, like maybe they never, maybe they're the actors who've never been in the room, mm -hmm. right? Like they started the acting relationship with the casting director post pandemic and they've only been self tapes kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so they're mm -hmm. not, that relationship isn't broken. This is just how it started. And they're used to posting on social media and, yeah. and, and this is a yeah. normal world for them. And so they're just kind of like, they don't even realize they're being watched. So it almost feels yeah. like voyeuristic in a way where there's no self-confidence at, I mean, so self-awareness at all because they forget someone's even watching them. Some, so uh, something, another part of that is something that dawned on me is that I'm actually watching, I'm watching you on screen. Right. And that's where I'm That's mm -hmm. where you're going to end up. Right. Right. Which is a totally different dynamic mm -hmm. in the room, which is like a live performance, which is completely different to where we're going to end up. And right. so I, I'm looking at you differently and judging you differently based on what you on camera. Right. Which is interesting. I'm making my choices closer to the final product than we were before. Which I've tried to think about, but I've also been like, but. I'm not directing the movie and I'm not expected to make the movie. So mm -hmm. No, there's that line that everyone's complaining about that you guys I mean the whole thing came out this week for for theatrical with SAG about the limited of pages, limited of ass, limited of Oh yeah. 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 Oper <laughs> yeah. So so I mean I don't think we are expecting you to make the movie. I think that just turned it turns into um look if you if you're lit good and you sound great, that's all we expect. Yeah, I think that the actor still wants there to be an element of uh, see me as a you know a thing that is alive that we're going to work this on the day, right? Yeah, not as yeah. like I'm just already cut out and you're just going to mm -hmm. buy me and put me in the thing. But when right? we're in the room, so one like you know certain directors are like, Duke, I just want to lit well in, in a, a plain background, don't tell them not to make a movie for me, right? They don't want that. Cause they're like, that's my job, right? And then two, right. when we're in the room, most of the time the director is looking at you on the monitor. Right. He's not paying attention to you there, right? He's looking to you up on the screen. But mm -hmm. wouldn't you agree, Frank, he does also get the the pheromones of the, the 30 seconds of talking to you before and the 30 seconds of how you behave after. And he I mean, can yeah. see I, what well, kind of person you're going to be. I think it's a double-edged sword to get to that point, Heather. So, like, I wish that I had had more Zoom or uh, taped auditions in my 20s. Yeah. When it, to be that raw person that you're yeah. talking about that yeah. gets discovered because I maybe could have taken the time I needed to really get it right. But now it's become the norm of having these tapes yeah. that I feel like now at the point I'm at as an actor, I'm missing having that redirect. I'm missing having the handshake and how was your day, getting a vibe of me for them to be like, is this guy cool? Is he down to hang on set? Do I want to see him every day? I like, could and I think that's key. More. My manager, my manager did this thing I never heard of. And I'm sure you, you guys do, but uh, she was like, oh, you need to make a personality real. And I was like, what's that? I had no idea what that was. And she goes, so many people are used to just seeing you as the character and since we're not having as many in-person auditions you need to make a personality real which basically sounds like a version of cribs or something but you you walk in like hey like i like you know walks on the beach i like to read here's my dog sparky and it's like this real it's supposed to show you as you but i laugh because even that is a performance right and if you're still given the room and the camera to do that how many times are you going to film yourself 
trying to look good right and that that's way. gonna so back, what I that's really gonna backfire for so many people that's gonna, <laughs> i, that's I gonna, agree <laughs> and i mean and but, I, but, but for I the guy that does it right, the guy, the guy that does it cool and like, and you, yeah. you vibe with it, it's going to be brilliant. For the guy, you're like, <laughs> right, the you, one guy, the one guy, yeah, yeah that does it right, yeah. you're going to be like, oh, that guy looks cool. He seems cool. That's but I, but it's but he can't act. I, he sucks. Right, but but man, what a great personality, <laughs> real. But she said it was really key to people who tend to get more intense stuff, which I usually get on average more so. And so Damn. she's like, it's good for them to show like you being more relaxed or yeah. more loose or whatever the thing is. I'm like that makes sense. But it's still nothing beats being in the room. You're yeah. in Van Nuys, go and to I, Six Flags, get on right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm really. Fun. Yeah, I'm just, fun the whole break. montage, <laughs> like playing basketball, going yeah. to the library, like every single thing you like to do. Making the uh, shot every time. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's up, you know, behind me. You know, yeah. <laughs> not, not even looking. Uh, I mean, but I think I think the key to me, and I would want the as a director myself, is like I would want the redirect to me is key because it'd be cool if like you come in with an idea how to play the character's yes. person, but but then they let you have that and then they give you the direction that they would give you on set, and they say now try it this way, and then I could actually maybe book the thing. And you know why that is, Frank? Because that's all I need to show them. You know and why yes, that is? Yes, you can do two takes. You can give three takes on an audition tape. I get it. But even then, you may not give that version they want. Yeah, well, Heather. Because right. your dearth of experience, your lifetime of experience as an actor, which is why you should be well paid at this point, which is why they would hire you because of that experience can be trusted and gained upon from them is what is going to be of benefit to them. They are not going to get playing this stupid game of guess what I want. And yep. that is the thing that is so infuriating. Take that out of the fucking thing. In the self-tape, that is all you get. It's guess what I want. Get that the fuck out of there. But we are all, old that's enough. All auditions. Though. No, it is not when you're in the room. I know, no, but you don't. But 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 the, everybody does the same. Like ninety point nine point nine percent people come in with the same choice. I know, but when you're choice. in the room, right? When and then you we have an actor. We, yeah, yeah, who, no, for sure. I agree with you. I totally agree with you that that is a, a very crucial moment, and that's typically when the callbacks happening now. Yeah, if we, we don't get them on self tapes. I know, but they can. They. But I'm telling you, everybody does almost the same thing. I agree. But when you're in the room and you have an actor who's been doing it for 30 years, you have the opportunity to go, okay, that was completely wrong, the choice that they made, but they've been doing it for 30 years. I bet they can do it a different way. Let's see. And then they do it and you're like, oh my God, you're hired. Well, no. One, and that one, is missing. Five, five you are you missing out on there, but you're missing out on giving that actor oh, of sure. experience sure. the opportunity for that. For sure. hundred percent. I and agree. And a bunch of us experienced actors are sitting on our ass behind self tapes without callbacks. I don't think that's the, yeah. I don't or think, just I, me. It's just no, me. I don't think that's the, it, the issue. The reason, <laughs> the reason you're not getting callbacks is because you're, we're seeing I'm a 50 year old woman. We're, yeah. it's just <laughs> we're, se we're seeing a hundred, <laughs> we're seeing hundreds of tapes now. What used to be 12 people per roll, yeah. we could fit them in the room. Mm -hmm. Now we don't know who, which one of you guys are going to come through and send us a tape. So we throw out a hundred requests, we get a hundred tapes and now it's one against a hundred. Mm. As opposed, to, it used right. to be one against twelve. We had they had they could pay for three days of casting. We would see twelve people slot because we had to see twenty rolls a day, and you could only fit in a certain amount. Now we're going through thousands of tapes. Why? Because we don't. There's no checks and balances. The system's broken, like you said it. Because the system's yeah, broken. Because well, I funny. will send you a request. You won't send me a tape. I did. <laughs> I will send you guys a, re a request. I did. And only 30 thirty percent of the people will send send a tape in. Okay. Well, then it's not. One against you know, a million. What's interesting too, what I say to that point though, when I was younger, I was more like, oh, this isn't the kind of thing I want to go out for. And so I would refuse some auditions. Yeah. And now in the last 10 years, 15 years, I tape everything just, just for practice. Yeah. Just to get seen, yeah. hoping it'll come back around. I know that Actors Access now has that really cool thing I love where you get to click the name of the casting director and you can see your whole history with them of every time you've read for them. I thought that's so great that's because then you can look back and be like, oh yeah, wow, they're calling me back even though I haven't booked anything. Maybe they remember you. They keep mm -hmm. bringing you back. That's great. And you, know? you guys See, can't, this you is can't the judge. hustler I'm talking about, you Frank Mosley. See, see, <laughs> see? You guys don't have enough to go on to judge the roles. You don't because literally those 
the specs mm-hmm. and the stuff. It's just made up by either me or by the director or by somebody. Else. And it's not there. It's like, oh, we got to get specs together. It's not like it's this well thought out most of the time. It's sort of like, here's an idea I have of what this is, but I want to mm-hmm. see everything. I want to see variations of it. It's not like they're putting that together going, that's what I want. That's like, here's mm-hmm. an idea of what I want. And so mm-hmm. I tell everybody, man, even if it says 25 to 30 and you're 40, read for it because you might change their mind. Yeah. 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 Actually, that's one of the things that I, I love the most is when I get a call for a role and they're like, we want you to read for this. And in the breakdown, it's not the right age. Yeah. And I'm like, and I'm like, I'll take it. Let me do something different with it. I'll put my spin on it or whatever. <clears throat> you know, so can't hurt just to be seen. So when you're casting, what is your approach or what are you? Are you? So I, I mostly cast, I mostly cast by offers by not doing too many auditions. Um, and it's, it's because I have such a network of friends and of actor friends and directors who've worked with actors who I like, and I want to work with, I have like just a rolling Google drive, you know, list of just names of people that I want to work with either that I, who I want to act with someday in something in a film or who I want to direct or both. And it just grows. And so a lot of the times for all my films, like my short, I may call Parthenon. I wrote that lead role for that actress. And I met her 10 years prior. And we were like, let's do something together. And so it was always kind of percolating in the back of my head. And then about eight years later from meeting her, I was like, oh, I think I have it. I think I have the idea. But now I got to get the money. And there was a brief scare toward the end where she might have timing wise had to drop out for something else. And I seriously had a moment where I was like, it was so specifically written for her that I would have had a hard time just filling in somebody for that role specifically, you know? And I think for that particular film, it's so body dance based and she comes from a dance performance artist background. To me, that was intrinsic to the character. So if I just got an actor, but they weren't as, lithe with their body or how to express themselves in that way then maybe it wouldn't be the same um or got or got a dancer that couldn't a dancer that couldn't do that yeah yeah. totally totally um so that's for me it's all just casting who do i want to work with and i write a role for you or you know and sometimes i I love taking recommendations too some if if i cast a friend and they're like who do you want to be in this you know with you is there somebody you have in mind i'll check out their work and if i like them then i might take them and I do that because I do the same, you know, I don't know how many films I've done in the indie world. I mean, I'd say more than often than not, where I get cast and then the director's like, Frank, who do you think should play the person opposite you? I was going to say, can and you, send, I, me that, can you, you send me know. that list? <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll send it over to Google Drive list. But I just love that feeling because then it's like you, you're actually helping your friends get work Mm -hmm. in a way you know and it's and i want to work with them so it's not like i'm it's not even work it's like me saying hey i want to work with this person i tell the director if you like them then it would be great we get a chance to work together you know i mean that's kind of how it happened with you and me heather with with uh some beasts yeah many years ago do you have a hard time with feeling precious about roles that you write that you get locked into a particular someone and then maybe as a as a writer director, yeah, and then and casting that particular person, and then it, maybe not working out. It has to be someone else, or not, not really. I'm pretty flexible in terms of most roles. Like I'll have like you know for each character, I'll give a breakdown of like ten friends who could play the part. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, if if I go through that list and ten friends can't do it, or ten people who I haven't worked with yet who I want to work with can't do it, then I move on to like okay, maybe I gotta have a casting call. Maybe I gotta. You know, especially in the case of like if I had kids in the movie, something like that, you know, I don't know any kid actors. I know like one or two and they're now getting older. So now they're out of age range for the role. That, that's, that's the uh, classic, classic you know. line where a director's like, do you know any good four or five year olds? And I go, yeah, but they're seven and eight now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the time you make it, they're yeah. 12. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, yeah. But in answer to your question, I don't I'm not. Um, it, Parthenon was a very specific exception mm-hmm. for that particular role. But otherwise, I'm very. I'm pretty flexible because I want to see what you can bring to that role. And I know that it'll be a little different than the next person, but it could provide a different, interesting energy that could behoove the film. You know, I just found it fascinating how Yen Tan was like, not as precious as I thought someone would Uh, be for um, 1985 with 
when some of the his casting was having to like okay. maybe shuffle around and I'm always curious to see how writer directors feel about being wanting this one particular person to play a role and then having to lose that person or you know recast okay. that person and whatnot. You you brought up something I'd want to I want to explore. You said to get the money like a lot of this stuff, uh, I, the shorts and stuff like that. How are you finding the resources? So for both, so for the two uh, features I I made, um, we had. Uh, events that we put on in order to raise money, like a fundraiser, yeah, basically. Yeah. And if, you know, depending on how, and then we would do, um, like, for example, my second feature, Her Wilderness, that I made, we did a, an, a very elaborate staged reading with like light and muse, live music and the actors on stage. And we made it like a big event. We had like wine and snacks and all. The, and basically, we used that money to help jumpstart the film. And I've done Indiegogo's and, you know, Seed and Sparks and Kickstarter, all that, that's always been helpful. But you can only keep asking for money right. for so long. And you start to feel like, hey, I'm really tapping the well out here. Yeah. And I don't want to be that guy who's like constantly, hey, I need some more money again. I'm making another film. So for my initial films, my first features, uh, my first feature, I split the cost with the core people who made the film. We all put money into the film. Um, for the shorts I made, for a lot of the shorts I made, they were either through Kickstarters or it was just for my own money, for my own savings that I had. But these last two shorts that I made here in LA since moving here, I put some money into them, but honestly, it was the writer star of those films who was looking for a director. And those shorts and are wanted, the event? Uh, and... The event and good condition. Okay. Those are like my two latest um, that I directed, but... Um, but Hugo D'Souza, he wrote those scripts <clears throat> and he stars in them. He's the lead and guy. I'm in the event. The, he's the lead guy. And I'm with him in the event. Yeah. yeah. It's so um, it's so great. Go, it's <laughs> on his site. Go check it out. It's so good. Yeah. Oh, it's thanks. so good. I'm glad you like it. But that was one of Don't the, ever dude, all really the shorts. You guys gotta go check out the shorts. They don't ever change. Like they're all re really good. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. But they but I mean, those were moments where I realized I was like, okay, here's a chance for me to direct somebody else's material. But I also was very upfront with him. And I said, look, I don't have the money. I don't have the money to really put into this right now, into these shorts. I was like, if you have the money, then I'm down. But like, I just, I'm not in a place to be able to do that. He goes, I can do the bulk of it. I was like, great. So that's how the first one happened. And then Good Condition came around. And it was the exact same thing where I think it was like, he's willing to throw down the bulk of the money so that we can collaborate we can work together. So that was really key because if it was all just me financing or if he didn't have any money either, I don't think there's any way. I mean, that's the hustle part right no. there, Heather. Like yeah. that's the hustle part, like figuring out how to get this stuff, you know, it's just the money part's so fucking hard, yeah. man. Yeah. And, and guys, the thing is those shorts only cost five to seven grand a piece. Yeah, but right? still, man. But for, for, out here in LA, yeah. it's so funny how there's such a, disparity of what it takes to make a yeah, short yeah. a general short and i talked to people or like a feature dude a feature as well people are a like feature, yeah a it, feature it, too i don't but to anyone make from short, la anyone from la was like yeah i don't think we can make it for less than four and we're all here in texas like we can make it for a hundred thousand like what are you talking about <laughs> yeah, <dude?"> right <laughs> right but that's the joke though john is like is that the shorts that i talk to people i hear who i meet they want to make a short film for two hundred thousand dollars totally yeah and um, that blows my mind. Yeah. And maybe it's from, I don't know, the bootstrapping, like upbringing in Texas and in the Indian. It is, world. dude. Like you it just is. get out there like Eagle Pinnell and you make your shit. Like you yeah. make it happen. Yeah. You know? We're not going to have trailers, but, folks. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Yeah. But I will say yeah. there are so many people that even with these two LA shorts that did favors yeah. for mm. me and Hugo. And Hugo was like, hopefully you know we can get some favors i'm like you can get some favors maybe because these are your kind of yeah, first yeah. films but i can't keep asking for favors like i'm tapped out yeah yeah so now anything i make past these shorts honestly guys i'm like my whole thing is like i gotta do it quote unquote the right way well, i gotta yeah. make sure here's I have, the thing right you know yeah your, your rolodex now and this is what i'm seeing emerge from this austin scene is everybody's getting to a place to where we can start financing based on their careers you know so it's mm. literally like me and you should have a conversation of something you want to make and just figuring out how to put that together in a yeah. way that can raise some financing for a price right that we can yeah. that we can do because it is possible yeah, yeah. Be amazing. this yeah. is exciting <laughs> 
Look at this. This is so exciting. <laughs> Cut, cut to me and him both going, why are we doing this? Cut to the, <laughs> just, just, this is the, the heads down. It's like, uh, we're, oh, we're, God, I'm I like, can't believe we thought yeah. that. I'm like, what's his name on the love connection? Yeah. <laughs> this is exciting. I think Frank's films have been called the miracles of economy by a major uh, cinematic voice. Yeah. Let's, that was, that was let's a nice. Let's amplify that. Let's, let's that make was this a nice love quote. connection and here, I, people. It is funny you bring up that quote because that quote really was like one that I took to heart. I was like, oh, wow. When you, because economy is something that I I love is aesthetically as a director, like I'm into minimalism. Like, how much can you ring out of one scene or one moment? Yeah. You know, I find that aesthetically. Me too. But also from a financial, yeah, I think it's twofold, right? That think, comment's like, oh wow, yeah. like these were made for no money, yeah. But hopefully they still get something out of yeah. it. Yeah, you know? I mean, corks, no. corks, uh, cattle baron, like you, like ringing out of a moment, right? Seriously, like, <laughs> <so> seriously. <laughs> I, no. Me and her were I talking about a- before, and it was just like, I thought it was about this. I thought it was going to be this. Yeah. I thought it was going to yeah. be this. Yeah. I was like, please watch uh-huh. that. Yeah, I mean, watch Frank just chew oh. without saying yeah. anything for God knows how long. <laughs> I mean, it's almost, I think it's 13. The short's 15 minutes. I talked for the last couple. So yeah, it's like yeah. 12, 13 yeah, It's minutes. amazing. It's just, it's just sitting I mean, there. just ringing. Just like, yeah. 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 So <laughs> uncomfortable. No, thanks. That was, that was, man, that was a joy. That was another big one. That was like right after Other Side of Paradise. And then Clay Lyford's Wuss was a big one and Cork's Cattle Bear. Yeah. Like those, those three Were like roles I got point. to do, it really kind of got to, start branching me out a little more. Yeah. And then I feel like, did we, and then we did some beasts not long after. Yes or no? We did. Yeah. So we started shooting that. Wow. We started shooting that in the fall of 2012, but we started prepping that. And I think talking with each other about it earlier that year, maybe even late 2011, I think. Um, God damn. So we're old. it was a, it was a while back, but I remember that, you know, I was just enamored of your performance and lovers of hate and oh. everything I'd seen you do. And we were talking about who is a similar situation. I was talking to camera, like, who are we going to have to play this role? And I was like, you know who I'm dying to work with? Oh. It's Heather Kafka. And he's like, he checked out your work and he was like, Oh, she's fantastic. Holy oh. shit. We need her. And so then it was like, just hoping you'd say yes, Heather. Oh. We were honestly worried that you were going to say no because of the type of film it was, which was a very seasonally shot oh, like, commitment. That's a dream you for know? me. That was a dream for me. I loved it. I love working. But it working. could scare people off. Oh, God, You know, no. to say, hey, we need you in waves, not just in a single that's, shoot. Why, no. why, do you, why do you love it? Just because it's a commitment to on time? On location, yeah. beautiful on location, long-term commitment. Uh, it's like a, it's like a novel on film. You get to live with it. Yeah. Really... Yeah. It's just mm-hmm. like a book come to life. And I just loved everything about that movie. Just gorgeous. It was special. It was yeah, so it was special. special. We got to live with like some real people who were really living that way, you know, mm-hmm. and learn new things. I love that about going on location and learning new lives. You know, these people were mm-hmm. actual farmers living that way and you get to learn. That's the best part. Like going to do a movie somewhere, you're like, you have these mini lives in these yes. different cities. Yeah. And you just drop oh, in. Yeah. 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 And, get and you're to like, feel I know what it's it. like to live in Wilmington now. Yes. I wanted to live in Wilmington. Yeah. I know what it's like. Yes. I it's love so, it. It's so special. And I, I mean, again, that's an appeal of a role, right? If somebody's yes. like, hey, you're going to play a guy here's his trade and i don't know that trade i'm like oh great i'm excited because i get to learn a trade yeah and do the part and you don't want to look like a novice when you do the work in the film and so the director john uh cameron we went out a couple of trips just he and i and stayed on the farm and i just got to milk the goats bale the hay and he would shoot me but it was like a documentary and we just shot hours of me just talking with the other farmers they're teaching me things and i feel like that all factored in by the time we actually started principal photography because then at least i had a little bit of a shorthand by then to not look like a total novice you know you always know when they cut out the piano and they cut out the, the milking of course, of yeah, when they go to the close to the other yeah, hand. yeah, yeah. yeah. The hands don't even match somebody else but it's like you know. and i think for me that's what i drew me to wanting to be an actor deep deep down is not even the the storytelling or the play of it all is that knowing that my life was very short and finite and that I couldn't make a decision on one 
lifetime and that as right. an actor I could potentially live many at, mm -hmm. in this one thing by getting to like drop in and experience lots of different lives. Um, and so like mm -hmm. here you could get to be a farmer for a second, you know, mm -hmm. um, and feel the essence of that without having to just do that one thing for your entire life. And that right. always I mean, appealed to me. This may be good or bad, but oftentimes you're dropped into like a heartache and like turmoil. This, this, this is true, true John. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> like the worst moment it, of that person's here, life. Here, you're a heroin yeah. addict for a week. It's <laughs> funny the actors that they, yeah, that they run, they're like, you know what, you're great. I need somebody to be thrown into the pit of despair right yeah. now. Who am I going to get for that? That's <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> You're uh, a heroin addict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you mind shaving your eyebrows yeah. again? Again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you mind laying in this pit of smeggy water and dying for the next two days? <laughs> like, oh, God. Sure. There, was, there was a period of time where I felt like, I don't know, something was in the air. But it's like every movie I did for a while was like the most physically... Like I'd be in the cold, like yeah. snow on a mountain, yeah, and like getting actually hurt. And like yeah. the next one, we we're like, now we need you again on another mountain, like a different part of the United States. I'm like, man, like what am I putting out there that they just want to <laughs> yeah. see Watch me in me nature? Suffer. You know, yeah. going through shit. Freeze you know? my testicles uh, off again. If yeah. it doesn't open yeah, with exactly. exterior Mojave Desert, I don't want to read it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can we do something on a beach, guys? Maybe. Yeah. Frank, I want you to be in my short film. Great. What are we going to do today? Well, you're just going to get killed. Um, okay, great. Like, I mean, on honestly, it's that. It's funny you say that because I did so many roles where I was the bad guy in so many movies or like some kind of sexual deviant in yeah. some way. And once they see you do it one time, they're like, Th that's the, that's yeah. it, man. That's I, the guy. That's the you guy. Know, we got yeah. it. My, my, poor, my poor mother is like, when are you going to be? Yeah. And I see, and then some beast finally happened, you know, yeah. and made her way happier. So, so let's talk about Freeland real quick, because that one looked like, maybe, uh, and maybe that was, maybe that was just because of the production uh, and the and the location, but it looked like pretty big in scope, as far as like just yeah, yeah it seemed like it was I mean, it was very, it was honestly very similar of a of a filmmaking process to some beast, said that they went to real farms. In this case, pot farms in Humboldt County, yeah. Northern California. Which is an interesting topic and too, that switch over for them trying to go legal is like a, super fascinating. It's really brilliant. And I think it's it's a it's a perspective that you don't often see in movies. And so oftentimes there's a sensationalism to like there's a Netflix show that came out, Murder Mountain, mm -hmm. came out years yep. ago about all the crime that's up there. And yes, it does exist up there, but this story was about what happened to all the old back to landers and how are they coping with that transition and you know the cast was great and it would but it was a very similar vibe as some beast there was a lot of improvisation i mean just a ton and you had a script it was kind of more of an outline and a blueprint um and you're living and working alongside real pot farmers just like some beast so it's like you know you're there in scenes and they're teaching how to trim and how to do all these things and uh so again a very lived in experience that was really really cool yeah. So you can now live on a farm and grow pot. I can milk a goat. <laughs> milk a goat, grow goat pot. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I need. Well, you're. Uh, you're I guess. I guess if, if all hell breaks loose, yeah. Frank, Frank's allowed to come onto the commune. He's allowed to. Come <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Offer a yeah. Yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. 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 But yeah, that that was a really uh, that was that was a special experience, and just getting again, it was one of those where like somebody was an offer, and I knew the producer. Uh, Laura Heberton, she's amazing. And she just was like, hey, I got a part for you. Do you want to do this? And Cretia was attached. And that was it. And then they asked us like about this other role. And we both were like, what about Lily Gladstone? But Cretia was pushing even harder at the time. And so then we got her on and everybody else just kind of fell into place. Um, it's so beautiful. It was great just to like yeah, live and beautiful. work with each other in that, you know. Yeah, it's a really beautiful film. And again, Thanks. your turn in it is like, oh, oh, Frank, yeah, I didn't see that he's, coming. He's he's a dick. Yeah, he's a god <laughs> damn it. Yeah, he's he's a real shithead. He's yeah. And again, those are the fun. I think those are the fun parts to uh, to play. Right? Is that yeah. I I love you know if you're gonna if you're gonna have an antagonistic 
streak, it'd be too easy to just know you're the antagonist from the front. But it's yeah. it's a little more human when there is a turn, and it takes on different almost. Especially in this movie, it almost took on kind of Shakespearean tragedy levels. Like, yeah. it kind of, you know, all her like her minions working under yeah. her. And there's like kind of an uprising. That's a great way to there's describe it. There's a lot of it. elements yeah. involved. Yeah. Um. So for me to have that turn was really, I was like, okay, now we're talking. Now I get to actually, it's coming from an emotional place. I'm just not a bad guy. It's like, yeah. oh, it's coming from jealousy. It's coming from um, abandonment. All these like feelings that are coming out. You know, that's so true. I, I feel like the world that you guys live in only allow for roles like that in movies like this, right? Like the more the higher the budget gets, the the less that you're allowed to to have these interesting storylines and characters. Like that's probably true. Yeah. So yeah, maybe be grateful. Probably. Maybe be grateful for that that you're not banker. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I'm great. Yeah, grateful for any of these roles, but you're always trying to find the new thing that'll that'll push you. And I don't know about you, Heather, but it's like, there's like certain roles where I'm like, Oh, like I have moments where I'm like, maybe I've done this type of role too many times. Enough. Like, how can I new spin on it? But then you yeah. do this one part and you're like, Oh, that was new. Yeah. That was a new feeling. There was yeah. like, there's something that comes out of it and it surprises yourself. And like, okay, wow. I found a new facet to this archetype and it surprises maybe even yourself. Yes. I think I just did that coming, oh, yeah. coming Great. soon. With yeah. Clay? No, uh, Brian Poiser. Brian Poiser, yeah. And oh, I, nice. yeah, yeah. Are, I can't wait to see that we're, one. We're making a, a comeback love affair. <laughs> it's our- I love it. I our mean, round the, two lightning may strike I mean, twice. I don't know. You, you two <laughs> plus Justin, it's like I'm down to see it. You know, It should be fun. Um, but if you get a chance and you like a little horror film, Don Suenos made a great short called Don't Ever Change. You can watch it on frankmosley.com. Frank Mosley is fantastic in it. I highly recommend you can go press play, watch it for free, and check out the rest of his amazing stuff. Learn about Frank Mosley. He is a dear, dear friend, and I am so glad and grateful that he came on our show, that he exists in the world, and that he continues to hustle and make great stuff. Follow his career. <laughs> he is a Thank you, he is a, he is a what? He's a He's a, a multi hyphenate. He is a uh, <laughs> God, I gotta get my glasses. Jesus. He's a staff pick. He's a freaking I don't know. He's a, all these things. <laughs> There's a long paper here with all kinds of big words. So Go awesome. check him out. Google thank him. You, awesome. Google. Thank you, Heather. Google. Thank Heather. you, man. Thank you for coming on. Hey, great. thank you for having me. Thanks, it was a blast. Frank. We love you. Cool. Love you, too. Our show today was recorded in studio by the good folks at Record ATX. Check them out at recordatx.com. Our theme music is produced by Jonathan Price. You can check out some of the sounds he makes with his project, The Mid-Cities, on Spotify. Follow, subscribe, and smash that like button if you see one. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you guys next time.